This is CBC Here and Now. The provincial government is requesting proposals to bring back electronic ankle bracelets. I'll have more on that story coming up on Here and Now. Now garbage collection with the new schedule will be from Tuesday to Friday. Mm -hmm. So, and that also leaves a day for, you know, maintenance and repairs and whatever else. The town of Paradise has cut back its garbage collection to four days a week. It says the new system will be more efficient and save money. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. We have details about a new electronic monitoring program for offenders in this province. The government announced in March that it would bring back the ankle bracelet program after it was cancelled in 2013. Now it's issued a request for proposals for the new program. Here and Now's Meg Roberts explains. It's been six years since electronic ankle bracelets were used in Newfoundland and Labrador and the province is now requesting proposals to bring the monitoring system back. One of the leading reasons, the jails are overcrowded, and according to the Minister of Justice and Safety, everyone serving time in prison might not be best suited for it. We have more people in than we really should. The second part is when you look at the fact that we all know the impacts of incarceration on individuals. It's there and it should be there. But at the same time, for some people, it's not the best means of rehabilitation. In many cases, it doesn't further that person's ability to reintegrate into society. Now, that's not the only reason why government feels this would be beneficial. With the advancement of technology, exclusion zones can now be set on the ankle bracelet. So, for example, if I wasn't allowed to cross onto this person's property, the authorities would be called when I stepped foot onto their yard. Now, the same thing can be said with parks and with school zones. Victims need to feel secure and safe knowing that that person's in the community. In many cases, we've had people out there that they don't feel safe. They don't feel that the response time is there. They don't feel comfortable with this person still in the community. Hopefully these individuals will now feel a greater sense of safety with this. The monitoring device will only be used after someone has been convicted of a crime. This pilot project, which will cost taxpayers about a quarter million, will be tested on the Avalon and in Labrador. The minister is hoping to have the technology installed come November. Now, not everyone is as convinced with the technology. The executive director at the John Howard Society, a group that helps rehabilitate inmates, says this is a very useful tool. However, it doesn't get to the root of the problem. She would also like more clarity on the types of convictions that would warrant the electronic monitor. Meg Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, there are some renewed questions about an already controversial St. John psychiatrist. Dr. David Craig is named in a lawsuit filed by Natasha Martin. The superintendent of prisons and the province are also named in the suit. Martin's daughter, Skye, was one of four inmates who died within a one-year period in our province's correctional facilities. Skye was in the Waterford. Um, Skye has a diagnosis of bipolar and ADHD and a team was put in place to come up with appropriate treatment plan and medication for Sky. Um, Sky left the Waterford with that treatment plan and medication. She went to Clarenville. He took my daughter off her medication, made the decision himself, did not consult anybody. Sky's mental health deteriorated significantly in the weeks leading up to her death. Her mental health decreased in line with her medication that was decreased. Well, in Martin's lawsuit, she singles out Dr. David Craig. Now, he's worked in the province's justice system for two decades, and over the years, his name has been in the news many times. Here and now's Mark Quinn has more. As early as 2004, the media began reporting on complaints about Dr. David Craig. Doug Squires is one of the inmates who spoke out about his treatment at Her Majesty's Penitentiary. I owe this to the boys down to the pen. I am a nervous wreck right now, Mark, talking to you. I've never been on TV in my life, and I'm shaking like a leaf here. But those guys, they're not all bad down there, and they're being tortured. 
Like others, Squires said Craig took inmates off medications that they had been prescribed before they were sentenced. Dozens of similar complaints were made to the provincial body that regulates doctors, but all of them were dismissed. In 2011, the province's citizens' representative, Barry Fleming, called for Craig to be removed from his duties in the justice system. And that same year, the provincial justice minister ordered a peer review of Craig's work. And I have confidence that the report is accurate and valid. The review found that Craig's psychiatric services meet the standard of care when compared to services in other provinces. There have been public calls for my head. Vindicated, Craig spoke with CBC News after the report was released. He said drugs can work, but some people are expecting too much from them. Instead of trying to solve the problems, this is what happens is you tend to wait for the doctor to find chemical balance, which doesn't exist. So I'm conservative from a drug point of view. Last week, the mother of a woman who died in the Clarenville Correctional Facility filed a lawsuit. In it, Natasha Martin says Craig refused to provide Sky Martin with medication she needed and used segregation to deal with her mental illness. Martin claims that caused Sky to experience severe mental anguish and emotional injury. Sky died in April 2018 as the result of an injury she caused to herself. Martin claims Craig failed to intervene to prevent it. He took my daughter off her medication made the decision himself, did not consult anybody. Craig hasn't responded to CBC's requests for comment. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, now to some municipal news. The town of Paradise is making some changes to its curbside garbage and recycling pickup, reducing the pickup by one day a week. Now the town says it's being done in the name of efficiency. Here are now Cease Hare reports. Changes are happening next week in Paradise when it comes to garbage collection. They'll be getting rid of collecting from these things on Mondays. Instead of collecting five days a week, the town will now only be collecting on four. Mayor Dan Bobbitt says dropping Monday made sense since most holidays fall on Monday. What happened normally was that sometimes it would get rescheduled because of the holiday. So then you have all the other days, like it's a domino effect. So if you're not collecting on Monday, then you got to go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And yes, Saturday, sometimes the crews were out on Saturday. So now it's a four day schedule. So it makes efficiencies all around. Bobbitt says moving to a four day schedule, Tuesday to Friday, will save some money in overtime and free up time for maintenance work on the gear. Arlene Scott lives in Paradise. She, like many others, is unfazed by the change. I think it's fine. I think it will get, get the job done, no problem. Mayor Bobbitt says some people will also have a new collection day because there's one less collection area. We wanted to do it in the fall as opposed to summer. Most people are on vacation. In the fall, everybody's back to normal and routine. And again, check out the schedule. Yeah. It's coming in, in everybody's mailbox. They should have it by now. The response on the sidewalk seems favorable. One man even told me that he's pleased that the town is coming up with ways to save money instead of increasing his taxes. Cease here, CBC News, Paradise. A little bit of a gray day out there today. We're seeing an area of low pressure just off of uh, Nova Scotia today, bringing some showers as well. Uh, but temperatures a little cooler with this system, sitting only around 16 degrees is the daytime high for St. John's. 21 in Cornerbrook, still holding on to that heat up through Labrador. Uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay reached a high near 28 degrees. Nain reached a high near 25. That was before the wind shifted. And that temperature is down to the teens right now. So there's that shower activity heading towards the northern peninsula. Uh, we are starting to see some clearing, a little bit of clearing. And if we zoom in a little bit uh, for the Avalon, we might even see some clearing in the metro area before the sun sets. I'll have all the details on your forecast coming up. Just a few years ago, Dan Meads was paralyzed. Now he runs ultra marathons. He completed a run many of us could only dream of finishing. Just ahead, Dan's story of running the Squamish 50. 
Well, many people think that uh, hunting and wildlife conservation have opposite goals, that one goes against the other. But a conference in St. John's this week is trying to build a connection between the two. Here and now's Katie Breen explains. It's estimated between 40 and 45 million people in Canada and the U.S. hunt some of their own food every year. And even more eat it. People generally share their catch with friends and family. I have launched this program to put a number on all of that, to quantify that in terms of its economic value. People here at the conference, from U.S. state governments, the outdoor industry, and different hunting and science-based NGOs, all want to know the dollar figure of the wild meat and foraged berries filling freezers. Right now we're in a wildlife crisis. Um, literally a third of the species in North America are at risk. Um, we're seeing cataclysmic collapses of animals all over the world. And that is because people aren't connected to them anymore. Hunting and fishing and other outdoor pursuits are the way to get people to connect to wildlife. Buxbaum says you can't save what you don't love and you can't love what you don't know. He says hunting and fishing builds a connection to nature and wildlife and makes people care. The idea is kind of like the saying, what you appreciate, appreciates. The Wild Harvest Initiative believes once a dollar figure is put on recreationally hunted animals, they'll be seen as more of a resource and treated better. Hunting and fishing are not the only ways to put a value on fish or wildlife, but I think if we put a value on wildlife, we, re we respect their environment, we respect their ocean, and we do a better job, I think, all overall of making sure that those populations are doing well. The group is going to look at data from 63 different jurisdictions to try and figure out the value. And it's also going to do surveys in every state and province to see how much wild-caught food is shared and what kind of societal and emotional value hunting has. They say it's the first time a comprehensive study like this has ever been done. But could turning wildlife into a commodity potentially have a negative impact? Well, there's a risk in all things when you try to innovate in new ways. But the people, including conservationists who've come here for the conference, say it's worth a shot. Katie Breen, CBC News, St. John's. Nurse practitioners in the province are calling it a milestone. New legislation comes into effect Sunday that will make it easier for them to diagnose health problems and prescribe med medicine without a doctor's approval. This changes in the regulations is really important to nurses and nursing in this province. Under the new rules outlined today, nurse practitioners will have more autonomy. Some of that authority is in place now, but they currently need additional oversight from a doctor if they want to provide certain services. The changes are expected to improve access to health care in rural and remote areas. Practitioners work in every part of Newfoundland and Labrador. They're integrated in almost every services, everything from the community um, into um, acute care systems. They're part of interdisciplinary teams everywhere in the province. Uh, this legislation is really a change, regulation change is really important to us because it removes some barriers around the scope of practice that existed in legacy legislation from many years ago. So it enables nurse practitioners to fully uh, practice at their scope of practice. So well, it's like running more than a third of the East Coast Trail in one weekend. The Squamish 50 is one of the hardest trail races in the country, 130 kilometers up and down the mountains of BC. For one runner from St. John's, conquering it was extra sweet. Here's why. I had a nerve condition about four years ago called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which left me paralyzed for, for quite a while. And um, I relearned to walk um, with some lots of great medical support and support from my family and friends. And then I hadn't been strong for a long time. And I started to just run on a treadmill in the winter in St. John's just as a way of trying to get a little bit fit um, and to build a little bit of strength. Started off just hoping to put in five kilometers and feel okay, and then the stretch goal became the Tele 10. And then after the Tele 10, it's just three more miles to a half marathon. And, you know, it's, things get a little bigger a little bit at a time. Yeah, I just finished something called the Squamish 50 50. Um, and so you run 50 miles in the mountains of British Columbia on the Saturday, and then you run 50 kilometers through the mountains on the Sunday. And so it's a 130 kilometer race over two days. 
Um, and it's a beautiful, brutal race. You know, I tried to run this thing last year and partway through the second day, um, I injured my leg and just couldn't finish. And so I was 100 kilometers in and an injury that I'd actually sustained early on the first day really bugged me and started to hurt a lot and made it so that I wasn't gonna be able to get this thing finished. And so going back this year, um, I had a few of those kilometers I wanted to try to pick up and I really wanted to finish this thing. Crossing that finish line, at the end of day two after 130 kilometers and feeling good and knowing that my time was good and that I had done all the right things and my body and my mind had held up and uh, it was just a really it was a beautiful moment to get to get that thing done and to feel good about it. I mean it still doesn't seem real to me honestly I, I, I wake up for an early morning run now and I'm putting the shoes on and I still sometimes just kind of chuckle like it seems so surreal to me both that I was that sick and that I couldn't walk, and, and now that I'm doing this, that I've had the privilege of putting on these shoes and running on this beautiful trail just about every day, it, it, none of it makes any sense. And the longer you feel good running, the longer you want to run. Um, and so now I, I can't imagine stopping. There's a live shot of the Narrows right now. Right now we're looking at a little bit of cloud cover and some drizzle, but there might be some clearing overnight tonight. I'll have the forecast details just ahead.
Welcome back, everyone. Yeah, with uh, all the showers in St. John's today, it wasn't the best day to be on a bike. No, but there's uh, one little guy who probably wouldn't mind that one bit. Frankie the Backpack Beagle has been uh, taking the internet by storm. Just have a look. <laughs> there Frank he is. There he is. Frankie <laughs> travels around Halifax in style, sporting doggles. That's goggles for dogs. Ah, that's <laughs> adorable. The eight-year-old pooch rides in the backpack of his owner, Gary Mullins, who's on a pedal bike. It's not a bad way to get around town. I don't know how my dogs would feel about uh, that mode of travel. I bet they would love it, actually. I bet you they would. Aww. Oh, especially that part. Getting some Starbucks. <laughs> Oh, they give you whipped cream, apparently. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> a cat paw chino? There you go. Wow, you're good. I must have heard that somewhere. You must have. <laughs> now you're pretty good. <laughs> yeah, so it was a little bit uh, wet uh, and a bit cooler as well. Yes. It's I've heard a lot of people will say, oh, it feels like fall is already here. But no, it's not. Good. Don't worry. Uh, well, not for some of us anyway. Mm -hmm. It's still quite warm in some areas across the province, but we'll take a look at those temperatures. They were a little bit cooler in the metro area. 16 degrees for St. John's. Uh, 22 in Twilling Gate, and then 25 was the afternoon high in St. Anthony. You can see that heat up through Labrador as well. 28 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay reached a high near 25 in Nain. And then the wind shifted and the temperatures dropped like a rock within an hour, dropped down to about 14 degrees. Currently sitting at 13, 28 still in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And then we've got uh, that area of low pressure just to the south of uh, Newfoundland right now with uh, temperatures in the teens along the south coast. So here's a look at that low. Uh, it's pretty big. It's stretching all the way through to the Maritimes right now. There's that rotation there. And we're still looking at that risk of uh, a few showers uh, for the next couple of hours up through the northern peninsula. They're starting to make their way towards St. Anthony. And as far as what is going to happen overnight, that low is going to skirt just south of Newfoundland, likely going to see that uh, potential for some periods of rain uh, for the south coast heading towards the Avalon by the early morning hours and then just that slight chance through central. So here's your uh, temperatures overnight. Uh, 14 degrees for Port of Asque, same for Marystown, 11 in Grand Falls, Windsor. Those winds generally out of the southwest between 10 to about 15 kilometers per hour uh, along the uh, west coast or rather east northeasterlies, southwesterlies for the north uh, northeast coast between 15 to 20 kilometers per hour. So uh, still easing from what we're seeing right now. And then up through Labrador, we're gonna stay uh, quite nice, 12 degrees for uh, Lab City tonight. Those winds will die down. And then we're looking at uh, some clear skies through the night. Six degrees for Nain, eight for Cartwright with those winds easing. Now tomorrow, we're still under the influence of that low pressure system, certainly for Eastern Newfoundland and the Avalon with showers through the day and then eventually going to see some clearing along the west coast, just a slight chance of some scattered showers through central. Otherwise, another beautiful day up through Labrador. Plenty of uh, sunshine, just some coastal uh, clouds are possible through the day. Otherwise, those temperatures are going to be a little bit cooler as well. So taking a look at those for uh, the Avalon, pretty similar to what we're seeing today. 19 degrees for Placentia, 20 in Marystown. And then uh, Clarenville sitting at 18 degrees. Again, those winds generally out of south picking up a little bit, 30 kilometers per hour tomorrow and then staying unsettled. The further we get towards the west coast, the better chance we will see some breaks in the cloud cover. 21 for Grand Falls, Windsor, 20 for Harbor Breton. Again, that sun potentially peaking out. Same thing along the south coast and then 23 degrees for Stephenville. So those temperatures are slowly climbing and uh, 22 for Gross Morm going to be a little bit of a different day as far as those temperatures go for St. Anthony. Should only reach a high near 15 degrees tomorrow under that cloud cover and much cooler along the coast as well. 12 degrees for Cartwright, 14 for Makovic and still hanging on to those temperatures in the 20s for a couple more days for Lab West. Uh, Lab City sitting at 25. Those winds generally out of the south southeast 20 to 30 kilometers per hour. Nine degrees is the afternoon high for Nain, so not much moving much from your overnight low. So that's a look at your forecast as we head towards the weekend. There's a little bit of a system in play, but I'll have all those details coming up. Don't be scared if someone says no. The only time you lose is when you stop trying. Girl power! And 
they're bringing that girl power to this province. Meet a group that's inspiring young girls to make their schools and their society a better place. That's ahead. Welcome back. Well, just in time for back to school, some powerful female voices are coming together tonight in St. John's. One Girl Empowered is an event aimed at inspiring young women in the community. Speakers will share their stories and they're all under 18. Our Jeremy Eaton has more on tonight's event. Jeremy? So the event is actually starting in about two minutes. Charlotte Brown has been touring across Canada and the United States all year long with her Fearless Women's Summit. Now this is an event that helps to unite women around the world who are letting go of fear to create the life of their dreams. Now here's a little of my chat earlier today with Miss Brown. Change cannot come about on its own. 
one month. Well, it's women coming together for the greater good of all women in this world, and no different than St. John's, Newfoundland, some of the greatest women in the world, in my opinion. And we're all coming to hear some amazing fearless speakers sharing their own fearless story. And these events are in support of our organization that does work to empower women and girls globally through education, starting their own businesses, and gaining employment skills to break the cycle of poverty. I'm Marigold, I'm eight years old, and I'm your next speaker. So our organization, like I said, brings women together for the greater good of all women in this world. And what we do is we connect women to be able to help and empower each other. And that through each of our stories, they are so powerful to be able to change this world. That when women step into their greatness and into their light, that they can make a difference. And that's what we inspire for every woman and girl to do. We have two great one girl speakers tonight, young females who are really changing and making a difference in their own community right here in St. John's, Newfoundland. So you have those two speakers, and who else will be speaking tonight? Yeah, we have Jackie Somerville and also a lady named Katie, both coming from the United States, women who are coming around the world to literally gather here and to encourage and inspire women right here in Newfoundland to be able to make a difference, whether it's right here in their community, whether it's globally, nationally, whatever they'd like to do. What calls on your heart to be able to make a difference? The only person whose opinion matters is yours. Oh. I love the ladies of Newfoundland and Labrador. They're just amazing. And I just love the city. It's so great. And you know how supportive everybody is. We're so lucky to have the St. John's Board of Trade that's working with newcomers to Canada, women to help start businesses here and to be able to thrive here in Newfoundland and Labrador. They're a huge part of what we're doing. And so we couldn't wait to come back. And what time does the event get underway and when will it wrap up tonight? Yeah, so we're kicking off at 6.30. I'm going to be talking about what One Woman is all about and how you can get involved. And then it'll all wrap around up around 9.30 or 10, you know, giving time for people to be able to network and meet some of the most incredible women right here in St. John's. Take your dream and go for it. Don't be scared if someone says no. The only time you lose is when you stop trying. So that event is sold out tonight, that it's starting right now. Now, two of those local speakers that uh, Ms. Brown talked about were Georgia Hinks, who at the age of nine helped raise money to build a school in Uganda, and Bay Roberts local Laura Keep, who was one of 30 Education First Canadian Youth Ambassadors back in 2018. Carolyn? Thanks, Jeremy. Well, turning now to some politics, with the federal election two months away, Canadian voters are mulling over their options. Many are uncertain about which party to support, but not about which issues matter most to them. Hannah Thibodeau of our Canada Votes team tells us about the results of a recent public opinion survey from the Angus Reid Institute. 52% of uncommitted voters, that's a big number. So that means there are a lot of people out there still haven't decided which party to vote for. And they do know which topics they want to hear from the party leaders. Take a look at the list of the top five. 71% say improving health care access is their number one issue. 70% say transparency and honesty in the federal government. 59% climate change. 58% access to affordable housing, and another 58% say the amount of taxes I owe. If you look at the top issue, it's health care. The Liberals have said that they will do a national pharmacare program. As for the Conservatives, they say they'll take steps to reduce the price of drugs, but they will do a more fill-in-the-gaps approach. As for the NDP, they say they will implement a national pharmacare program by next year, so by 2020. And as for the Greens, they also say they will put forward a national pharmacare strategy as well. So the second most important issue on that list is transparency and honesty in the federal government with 70% of the people thinking that's the largest issue. However, when they were asked if you had to just pick one single issue, that drops to only 7%. And the two top issues, single issues, that these uncommitted voters say are the top issues, climate tops with 23%, healthcare access at 18%. So with this shaping up to be a close political race and half of the electorate out there still uncommitted, you can tell that the parties will be trying to persuade these voters because it's often the uncommitted voters who decide elections. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Toronto. 
Well, keeping with Canadian politics, expect a collision of views about the Trudeau government's carbon pricing plan in the election campaign ahead. Conservatives are already slamming Liberals for what they say is a cover-up of the increased cost of that plan four years from now. Liberals are slamming back against what they see as conservative misinformation. It is clear that what was negotiated with the provinces and territories was to 2022. So anything else would have to be also negotiated. There is no plan to increase. The conservative politicians want to fear monger. They want to cause confusion. They would prefer to mislead Ontarians about and Canadians about what we're doing. Now, the Liberal carbon pricing plan was outlined in 2016 as a means of addressing climate change. The plan sets benchmarks for greenhouse gas emissions and a fee of up to $50 per tonne for those who exceed the benchmarks. Provinces and territories can avoid fees if they have compatible emissions reduction plans. Where they do not, individual residents are eligible for rebate checks to offset the carbon pricing. Conservatives say Liberals are raising the cost of living. Liberals say Conservatives have no workable climate strategy. Well, south of the border in the states, 16 women who accused Jeffrey Epstein of sexually assaulting them as minors had their day in court, even though his suicide means there will be no trial. It was both empowering and infuriating to know that the person who I needed to hear those words is not here to hear them. The judge made the rare move of inviting the women to speak after Epstein's death. The women told the court how they were recruited and abused as teenagers, and they encouraged prosecutors to bring Epstein's associates to justice. Epstein was facing numerous sex trafficking charges when he was found dead in his jail cell earlier this month. Well, the president of Brazil is pushing aside international help in fighting the forest fires raging in the Amazon. Jair Bolsonaro insists the situation is under control, but his rejection appears in part to be personal. Bolsonaro says he'll accept $26 million in aid pledged by the G7, but not until French President Emmanuel Macron apologizes for recent comments, questioning Bolsonaro's handling of the fires. Canada offered another $15 million to the firefighting effort. If Brazil continues to refuse the international aid, the money will go to neighboring countries that are also dealing with wildfires. Well, could whale snot crack the code of the right whale crisis? A team of scientists and their drone hope so. That's ahead on Here and Now.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, a kind of mobile lab is traveling through the Gulf of St. Lawrence in search of something you might not expect. A research vessel is trying to learn more about the habits of the North Atlantic right whale. Eight of the endangered animals have died in Canadian waters this year, and scientists hope collecting samples will help explain why. Gabriel Fami reports. This drone goes where no scientist can, hovering over a surfacing right whale's blowhole, capturing samples of wet breath, and yes, whale snot. It's a fun little system and it's really quick and uh, we were glad we had a, a drone racing pilot to, to, to pilot that one for us. It's, a, it's a, quite a task getting that over the whale. The drone returns with its precious cargo, where eager scientists will pour over its contents for clues about the whale's health. And we're hopefully looking at uh, cortisol, um, testosterone, progesterone. Anything that will help researchers understand what's happening to these endangered animals. Eight right whales have been found dead this season, floating in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, where they've been chasing their main food source on the move north in pursuit of colder waters and more bountiful prey. Finding a meal is getting increasingly difficult. Stress in humans causes a lack of fertility. It's likely to be the same in the whales. So by exploring how stressed the whales are related to perhaps ship noise or reduced prey in the environment, we can assess their um, potential for uh, recovering. Scientists spotted seven whale calves earlier this season. A good sign, but not enough to keep the species from extinction. Stress from human interference may be a key factor. When the world ground to a halt during the September 11th terror attacks, there were fewer ships moving about, and right whales appeared healthier. Ships create a lot of noise that sort of floods the Atlantic Basin, and when that went down, the stress levels in the whales also went down. That's the point of this mission, to assess the role human activity may be having on this dwindling population. All of that information, we can take that and give it to the people who have to make decisions and develop the policies for protecting the whales. The drone here um, has two flight batteries. There are reasons to hope. In one remarkable aerial snap during the trip, 10 North Atlantic right whales swimming next to each other. An incredible sight, but a worrying one too, as slow swimmers that stay close to the surface these whales are particularly vulnerable newcomers to the busy waters of the Gulf. Gabrielle Fami, CBC News, Dalhousie. Well, moving west now, a Manitoba farmer has been dealing with a bothersome eyesore on his property for the past four years. Hundreds of disused rail cars that are owned by the government of Alberta. The CBC's Riley Lechuk has more. From above, rail cars as far as the eye can see. 258 in total. Ian Robson would know they've been parked along his farmland for almost four years. I'm tired of looking at them. Robson says the long line of cars are on the CP rail line near his home, he says is largely unused. He says they first appeared in October 2015 and stretched nearly five kilometers along the rural Manitoba landscape, each bearing a large Alberta emblem, inviting those who see them to take an Alberta break a former provincial tourism campaign. But Robson thinks this break has been long enough. Uh, I used to have a good view of the other side of my property because they, they cut right through the middle of my property and I could see what was going on, who's uh, over there, where my cows are. And, uh, you know, the, the view is spoiled, put it that way. Robson says the view isn't a big deal, but the park rail cars cause snow to drift and build up, creating moisture issues that delay seeding in the spring. The hoppers are owned by the Alberta government, purchased in the 1980s to help move grain across western Canada. Some were leased to CP Rail, but the Alberta government says the company no longer needs them. But Robson believes the cars do still have life. The purpose of the Alberta government buying them was to help out farmers. The use of those cars earns money for farmers, but for the entire country of Canada. And uh, so they were, they were worthwhile investments and they need to be looked after. He says the parked cars speak to a larger trend in rural grain transportation. Local elevators that used to dot the rural landscape have been torn down, causing producers to truck grain long distances by road. The Alberta government says it has leased out more than 100 of the hoppers so far, 
and plans to either lease or sell the rest. But it's not clear when that will happen. Robson hopes to see these cars moved out of here soon. He says he wants to see them put back into service, moving grain across the country. Riley Lechuk, CBC News, near Hartney, Manitoba. Welcome back to Hearing Now. Well, 30 years ago, the government had a novel approach to summer school. It actually paid students to attend class and even gave them a bonus if they passed. It was at a time when the province had a large dropout rate. One in three students didn't finish high school and government wanted to see if more students would walk away with a diploma. So from our archives, here's the CBC's Larry Hudson. There are 19 grades 9, 10 and 11 students enrolled in a summer school at Springdale. All of them just missed getting passing marks in either English, math or science this year. Now they are working towards improving their grades before regular school resumes in September. If the program works, the students will avoid having to repeat an entire year. The idea is it's the number of electrons that are flowing in a circle. Educators say when students can't grasp a subject, they become frustrated and tend to drop out of school. When that happens, they invariably become an unemployment statistic. That's what this five-week program is trying to prevent. But these youngsters are not spending all of their summer holidays in the classroom. School ends every day at noon, and what's more, each student is paid $50 a week as an incentive to learn. But they say they are not in it for the oh, money. Really, I just really wanted to go back, right? Because to get the courses that I missed. Well, I mean, $50 helps a bit, but, you know, it's just a bit of pocket money. I need marks bad. <laughs> um, oh, money can come in handy, but that's not, re that's not the reason. Because this is a pilot project, summer school entrance was restricted this year with the participants being recommended by their regular teachers and principals. Students who uh, were close to passing had at least 35% in their final mark and needed two or three subjects to help them get through the grades. 
We are giving these students a chance to improve their academic standing, hopefully to pass their grades, to stay in school and to have the opportunity of advancing and progressing through schooling in a normal way. It will likely be well into the next school year before a full evaluation of this pilot project is made. Then, if the results are positive, it could be extended to include the whole of rural Newfoundland. This is Larry Hudson reporting from Springdale. Guessing that didn't last too long. <laughs> well, you know, it was 30 years ago. I'm not sure what was more impressive, the fact that the government offered to pay people to go to school or those amazing haircuts. Uh, and outfits. <laughs> <laughs> but switching from school to shopping, earlier this year, Costco made headlines when the largest store it has in Canada opened up in Galway with 500 employees and more than 18,000 square feet of shopping. So this was the scene on June 27th when people actually lined up before the doors even opened to get a good look at the new space. In the first 15 minutes, 500 people walked through the doors its massive parking lot featured a thousand spaces, 300 more than the old one. It seems like a Costco's lover dream come true. Then this nightmare happened. This is the first ever Costco opening up in China. The store in Shanghai was absolute madness. And look at them fighting to get their hands on a roast chicken. So people were lined up around the block to get in there and there were reports that it took more than three hours to find a parking spot. And as you can see, there's lots there, more shopping carts than people at the popular bulk store. Now the local media reported that the store had to be shut down due to the popularity. See, you can see the people clamoring to get in there. I guess they, I know that they have a couple of stores in Japan. I know they have a couple in Taiwan. And according to my brother who lives in Taiwan, the two of them in Taiwan are the biggest money makers for Costco. And here in our own province, the popularity of our Costco hasn't died. I was there at 9.45 this morning, and despite the store not opening until 10 a.m., people were already on their way out with carts full of everything that you could imagine. Wow. Wow. <laughs> thanks, Jeremy. Interesting to see what, uh, what's happening with Costco in China. <laughs> Okay, so before we get to the weather, the last time we checked in with you, we had a beagle in a backpack, and now we have something a little more native to Newfoundland. Here she comes. Ah, that of course <laughs> is a moose on a golf green. Uh, this was taken by Randy Blake and uh, at Glen Denning Golf Club. Blake was in a bunker getting ready to take his shot when he had some competition. <laughs> Wouldn't want to... Uh, up against that guy for sure. No. Beautiful creature. It is beautiful. See a lot of uh, moose out on golf greens. Yeah, we've got lots of video. Look, it's pouring rain too. Mm -hmm. Not exactly the best to be out golfing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome there video. he goes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So how's the long range looking? Yeah, once we get uh, through some showers again tomorrow, we'll take a, a quick look at the forecast one more time uh, through the afternoon. We are looking at that rain through the day uh, with temperatures sitting around 17 degrees tomorrow afternoon. And then the sunshine will peak out, but that'll be along the west coast. So Port of Basque, Stephenville looking at that chance uh, or likely seeing the sun peak out. 22, 23 degrees and then cooler up uh, along the northeast coast again. And that's because we're going to get into... Uh, that air mass up there. Otherwise, we're looking at plenty of sunshine, 25 degrees in Lab City tomorrow, and then that drop in temperatures for Nain at 9 degrees. Now, as we head into the day on Thursday, that low pressure system that's going to affect us will move out of the way, and it does look like things should clear out for the most part uh, with some sunshine. Again, up through uh, Labrador as well. The next system will move in. This is actually the remnants that we've been talking or that I've been talking about uh, since yesterday of that tropical depression. So that's going to move in and spread a little bit further uh, east through Labrador as of Friday morning, early Friday morning. But those temperatures uh, are still going to stay quite cool for the Avalon. We are looking at uh, the potential for some showers, some drizzle on Thursday, 13 degrees. And then again, that sunshine along the west coast, uh, 16 degrees, so a little cooler for Port of Basque. And then eventually those temperatures will drop for Lab City again, thanks to that rain, 15 degrees. And then Happy Valley Goose Bay sitting at 23 through the day. So here's a look at that system we were talking about. Uh, this is Tropical Depression 6. 
and it is losing steam. And as of now, the latest uh, forecast just came out from the Hurricane Center. It does look like by Thursday, so within 48 hours, it will uh, lose that. It'll become extra tropical and will just likely be a low pressure system that'll head towards um, the Maritime Provinces and then eventually us with just some rain and wind. So nothing that we've uh, we haven't seen before. But again, those temperatures will stay a little cool until we get to that point. So sitting around the uh, teens into Friday with that generally gray skies we could see the sun peak out at times, but overall just looking at gray skies. The weekend as of now doesn't look too bad. Looks like things will clear out sitting around 23 degrees by Saturday and Sunday dipping a little bit to 18. Essentially the exact same forecast for central Newfoundland, just a little bit warmer until we get to the weekend, 24 degrees by the time Saturday rolls around. And then for western Newfoundland, sunshine right till Thursday, Friday with that system, 22 degrees, those winds picking up a little bit as well, and then dipping back down on Saturday to about 16 degrees. Temperatures over the next couple of days for eastern Labrador staying mild and then dipping your overnight low single digits by the time the weekend rolls around. And we're looking at the same thing for western Labrador. Look at those temperatures by Saturday and Sunday down to the low single digits. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up. Apparently right now I'll have it for you. <laughs> Here's a look at your uh, weather photo of the day. Great shot there. No denying where that is, but I'll tell you where it's too when we come back. This next video is a sight to see. A giant field of volcanic rocks is drifting through the South Pacific. Have a look at that. A sea of stone called pumice covers more than 150 square kilometers of ocean near Tonga. It's thought to be from the eruption of an underwater volcano. Now, pumice floats because it's filled with tiny air bubbles. Australian sailors spotted it earlier this month. 
Scientists say the mass of rock will likely become home to marine life as it drifts. If it reaches Australia, it could be a boost for the damaged Great Barrier Reef. Amazing. Different way to see that for sure. Normally wow. that's in the bathroom, <laughs> the pumice stone. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's so interesting to see that. It's a lot of exfoliator. Max, absolutely. Yeah. Natural exfoliant. Amazing. Very cool. And it's so interesting that it could have a positive effect for the Great Barrier Reef. It's great to see. Yeah. Absolutely. Anything that helps that for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our uh, weather photo of the day. That's a good one. Rainbow over Churchill Falls. Nice. Gorgeous shot there. Thank you so much for uh, sending that in. Beautiful. A beautiful shot. I was just, I love that one. As soon as I saw that, Michelle Power sent us that photo. And if you have any weather photos or photos you'd like to send us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. <laughs> great. Great shot. That's it for us. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Have a great night. Good night.